start the recording. And let's share the screen. This one. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's lecture, Sample Systems Part B. Carrying on from uh, obviously part A, where we talked about some general sample system stuff, and here we'll talk about a little bit more sample system stuff. Okay, what just happened there? That wasn't supposed to happen. Let's try this again. All right. What is going on here? All right. Can we see the outcomes on the screen there now that I got my tech figured out, I think? Yes. All right. So outcomes of this ILM explain analyzer sampling systems, components, and material specs. A little bit different than the first ILM. There's a bit of overlap in here. Um, but we look at some specific things in this ILM that we haven't looked at before. Uh, the first one is, is something uh, looking at sample loop time. Um, sample loop time is, is uh, the measure of time that it takes to get the sample from the process tap point uh, to the analyzer, and we'll look at why that's important. Uh, second one here, uh, describe components design and limitations of sample systems. So this is a bit of a review of some of the hardware that we looked at uh, before, um, but it kind of ties in with sample loop time. Then we'll get into some troubleshooting of systems, which is relatively basic. Uh, and then objective four uh, here defines grab sampling and its techniques, which is um, good if you're in a position where you have to grab samples. I guess, because you'll learn everything that you could ever want to know about uh, grab samples. So that's basically this ILM. It's not super heavy. Uh, there is some math in here uh, when we start talking about sample loop time. But aside from that, it's uh, relatively general uh, information. OK, so let's describe the importance of sample loop time. First, we'll define it. Sample loop time uh, is the time it takes the sample to get from the process to the analyzer, as I said earlier. Uh, total system lag time, another definition here is the sum of the sample loop time and the response time of the analyzer. So we, we look at uh, the processing time of the analyzer, really how long does it take to do its job to analyze the sample? And then the other component of that time factor is how long does it take to get the sample to the analyzer. And when we combine those two things here, that's what the total system lag time is. Uh, and depending on the application, uh, you know, a short period of time may be necessary, a longer period of time may be tolerable. Um, but that's our objective here to figure out when and where uh, those types of situations would apply. OK, uh, so why is this time important? Um, Analyzers by ILM definition here operate in one of three different modes, and the time factor impacts in different ways related to its selected function. So these three different control modes that we're talking about uh, are direct control, indirect control, and optimization control. And they have different requirements in terms of uh, time. Uh, Logic-wise, it's I think it makes pretty, pretty good sense. And this is a nice little chart that describes what's going on uh, under these different circumstances. So if we had a direct control uh, situation, uh, this means that the analyzer uh, directly controls a final control element. And as such, it's relatively important that the response time uh, is relatively quick. Um, we're making process uh, control changes using this analyzer, so we want it to be quick because the analyzer has probably detected something that's askew uh, and in order to fix it uh, and avoid off-spec products and poor quality issues and things of that nature, we want a change to happen relatively quickly. So that's direct control. Uh, indirect control is the same kind of idea, but it controls through a processor which manages the final control element. Um, this is kind of like uh, 
you know, it's, it's somewhere in between the, the two methods that, or the two other methods that we're looking at here. But this is kind of like a basic control system where we take a measurement, whether it's a transmitter uh, or an analyzer, send that information to the uh, PLC. The PLC does its math, and then provides an output to the final control element. Uh, and as a result of all the processing and stuff that has to go on, it's a little bit slower. Um, but we would call this acceptable uh, for indirect control. Then the final category here, the control mode called optimization control, um, where the analyzer optimizes the process. And this is typically something like uh, using an oxygen analyzer or carbon monoxide analyzer on a burner or some type of a combustion uh, application, just in order to kind of tweak the air fuel uh, ratio to make sure that you're burning uh, efficiently and effectively and uh, economically. Um, not really a process thing, more of a tweaking kind of thing. Uh, and for this particular application, slow is a little bit uh, more acceptable. So we have three modes, direct, indirect, and optimization. Okay, sample loop time. Uh, again, this is relatively straightforward, but generally speaking, if there's a sample system, uh, it's either gonna be optimizing or indirectly controlling. Uh, if it's mounted directly in the process, then it's probably directly controlling. So it has to do also with the different uh, connection method that we choose for, right? Uh, and you can drive uh, kind of the mode that we're going for based on where that sensor is located. So you're saying if it's directly mounted in the process, there's probably a reason that we want it to be in the process. We've learned in the last ILM that having the sensor in the process provides us the fastest response and that just in mounting uh, the analyzer and sensor um, is the slowest method of getting the, uh, the reading of the, of the process. So just by picking the particular uh, transport method or no transport method uh, gives you an indication of uh, what the importance of this loop time is. Um, so basically, uh, the general guideline here says that the design should ensure that the maximum lag time is 90 seconds. Uh, and this includes 60 seconds for the transport portion. So the portion here uh, that gets it near the analyzer, uh, not to scale, of course, and then 30 seconds for the conditioning, uh, the conditioning portion. So this is where you, you know you do your filtering, your heating, uh, your cooling, that type of uh, that type of thing here. And then the analyzer, of course, contributes uh, its little portion to this time that we're not including it this moment here. Um, but 90 seconds, basically 60 seconds for the uh, transport time, and then 30 seconds for the conditioning time. And then it hits the analyzer, which will induce, uh, introduce a little bit more time, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so there's a couple different ways that we can speed up this time if it's not fast enough for us. Uh, in the next few slides, we're going to address uh, modifications that we can do to the sample transport system basically uh, in order to increase the transport time. Uh, we're going to look at differential pressure for fast loops, so using differential pressure to generate uh, increased flow velocity, uh, which will in turn increase our transport time getting the, uh, the fluid from A to B. Uh, tubing size, uh, probably the simplest and easiest way to increase or decrease the transport time is by reducing the volume uh, of the sample. So if you got you know a couple hundred feet of half inch tubing, uh, you can do the math on that and then compare it to a couple hundred feet of quarter inch tubing and do the math on that. And you'll see that reducing the tubing side, size reduces the volume, uh, thereby reduces the amount of time it takes to uh, transport the, the sample from the process to the analyzer. Uh, thirdly, here we have pumps. We'll talk about a different kind of pumps where we can uh, force the sample towards the analyzer uh, with a little bit more energy. And the last uh, option we're going to look at here is called vaporizing regulators, uh, which in its basic form is taking a liquid sample uh, and vaporizing it into a gas because gases are a lot uh, easier to transport in terms of uh, speed. Okay, so fast loop transport here, the first one here. Uh, the flow in a fast loop system is much faster due to the difference in pressure across the pump. And here, here's an example where we actually have a pump, and I think it's the first time we've seen that. Although we have seen this um, fast loop configuration before, just on a, on a pipe here. So fast loop flow rates uh, typically are in the thousands of milliliters per minute, um, whereas most analyzers usually 
only needed a few hundreds of milliliters per minute. So if we can provide it with 10 times uh, more flow, it's going to uh, increase the, the speed that the sample is obviously going to make it to the to the analyzer here. So this is by uh, by using a pump and we have an increased velocity here uh, coming out of a larger pipe into a smaller pipe. So again, increasing velocity and we've got the pressure of the pump as well, pushing it uh, through the tubing. So it goes rather quickly uh, with the passive transport method. Sample tubing, of course, uh, always smaller than the process line. Uh, and the general idea, as I described earlier, is that smaller tubing has less volume, thus it's going to have a higher flow rate. Uh, if there is no pump uh, to create the faster flow, uh, creating the differential pressure, we can use other things to provide the differential, uh, the differential pressure, uh, such as orifices, exchangers, valves, uh, things of, of that nature. Uh, they'll do the, the same thing uh, here again. Uh, remember, uh, we put a restriction in here. It's going to create a high pressure area here, a low pressure uh, area here, and it's that differential uh, that generates the the flow, <coughs> excuse me, in this loop. So there are other uh, mechanical things that we can put in there to make this happen, such as orifices, exchangers, valves, uh, other things. If no pressure drop is available, uh, a pump may also be installed uh, for this purpose. And we've talked about that in the previous slide, but we'll look at a couple of different pumps here on pages four and five. Um, <clears throat> there's many, many different kinds from the uh, from this uh, centrifugal type pump that we have here. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm gonna itch in my throat here. Um, but we're gonna talk specifically about an ejector pump, which is something like this, where we have instrument air fed through uh, a venturi. And as we blow that instrument air through this venturi, it has a uh, physical characteristic of wanting to draw the sample out of the process stream through this rotometer. So that's one method of doing it. Uh, another method is, of course, a, a diaphragm pump here, um, a driven pump, a diaphragm that's moving in and out, back and forth, and it is pumping, uh, drawing it out and pushing it along the transport system here. So either pushing or pulling. Gas apple transport. Uh, this is the last point I think that we were going to talk about in terms of uh, getting the process from here to there. Uh, when a liquid is vaporized, its volume may increase up to 600 times. This is the example from the ILM. Um, if we vaporize the liquid at the sample point uh, and keep it heated, uh, thus keeping it vaporized, um, the lag time is greatly reduced. And that is because it's a lot uh, easier to move uh, less dense uh, medium, such as a gas, than it is to move uh, something with more density like a liquid. This brings us into calculating lag times. Um, my humble opinion is that there's a little bit too much focus in here on calculating lag times for our purposes as uh, instrument and control technicians. Um, but again, um, it gives you the theoretical background uh, to understand the, the um, contributing factors to transport time. Uh, and by mathematically proving it, it kind of locks it in for you. So when we're calculating uh, lag times, we have to calculate the two parts. The first part is the uh, sample lag, again, which we talked about uh, involves the sample transport portion of, of the analyzer system, and then the conditioning lag, which is uh, that chunk of hardware uh, that sets the sample up to be uh, appropriate for the analyzer. So some, it's still, it's math, but it's not terribly crazy math. Um, to, to calculate the sample lag time, uh, we use a formula here. Uh, lag time is equal to the displaced volume uh, in cubic centimeters divided by the volumetric flow rate in cubic centimeters. So it's not tricky math by any means, but it involves us uh, calculating the volume of our tubing, which you know involves a little bit of pi, pi math, uh, and then Divided that by the volumetric flow rate, which is relatively uh, straightforward. Okay, um, just a quick little thing on volumetric flow rate and standard conditions. Um, we may or may not have to uh, convert uh, standard conditions into volumetric flow rate, usually, and based on the uh, pretense of the ILM, this is what they want you to do. Um, and again, standard conditions involve converting generally to Calvin 
and uh, 101.325 uh, KPAs and doing a little bit of math here. So uh, we don't get into this math too heavily. Um, I'm not going to ask you any uh, super challenging combinations of all this kind of math, um, but do understand that you have to um, probably convert from standard flow rates into um, volumetric flow rates so that you can do the math properly. But the most important parts here to remember is that temperature is absolute, which means that it's going to be in Kelvin. Um, so we're going to have to add, you know, add 273.15 to whatever our standard value is here. Um, and in this case, you're saying it's uh, 294.26, which is uh, 73, 93, 20, 20 degrees or 21 degrees, something like that. Uh, absolute pressure uh, is 101.325 kPa's. And again, don't get too hung up on this. Uh, there will be one example that you guys will have to use this conversion for uh, in the ILM. Okay, so the first thing we have to do uh, is calculate that volumetric flow rate conversion, and I'm not doing any fancy that, uh, fancy math for you here, but again, uh, taking into consideration um, the temperatures and pressures that are relevant at the, uh, at the time of your calculation and getting the volumetric flow rate uh, figured out, and then figuring out what our, what our volume is here. So you'll see that we have 100 feet of uh, tubing and about five cubic centimeters per foot, which means that we have about 500 cubic centimeters of volume. Uh, and if we're moving at 500 cubic centimeters per minute, how long is it going to take from here to here? Well, if I've got 500 cubic centimeters of volume and it's flowing at 500 cubic centimeters per minute, that tells me that to get from here to here is going to take me one minute, right? It's, uh, it's not super complicated math. Uh, then, of course, we're going to throw in the conditioning, uh, the conditioning unit math uh, to add on to that, of course, to make our total, our total system lag time. Okay, the conditioning lag um, deals with all the equipment that's inside the conditioning cabinet, whether it's a filter or valve regulators, uh, strainers, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but if it's part of the conditioning system, um, it, it adds volume is the long story short here. Uh, in order for us to get all the uh, stale uh, analyzer analyte out of, out of the sample handling condition, uh, it's not just a matter of putting in uh, the volume of the sample handling condition once. It takes some time to you know dig out all the stuff that's been in here. Uh, and the guideline that is given in the ILM here is that purging uh, takes three times the volume for a good purge. So in our example that we're looking at, in this case here, a 40 cc chamber uh, is effectively, uh, based on this three times factor, 120 cubic centimeters. And as such, we have to do the math uh, accordingly. So uh, using a formula for conditioning lag time, again, it's the same formula as it is for the sample uh, lag time. We take the volume and then we divide it by the, the volumetric flow rate that we are providing. So for our example here, um, we have 120 cubic centimeters uh, for our combined volume of our conditioning system, which is 40 times three, uh, divided by our volumetric flow rate in cubic centimeters. And I, and I know I skipped I uh, skipped a step in the math. Uh, this, this step right here, uh, we do some uh, math conversions and that's how we end up getting down to 252 cubic centimeters here. Uh, it goes through in the ILM. It's not really complicated, so I didn't think I would include it here. Um, but again, doing that uh, simple, straightforward math there tells us that it's gonna take us 0 0.048 minutes to completely purge our uh, 40 cc chamber in this example, or this representation of our uh, conditioning system. Okay, so when we're calculating, uh, keep in mind that these are absolute values. Uh, if at a standard temperature, the factor is one and we don't deal with it, that would be pretty easy. Um, but of course, what's the point of having the exercise if we're just going to give it to you in standard temperatures? That's why we make you do uh, the standard slash volumetric conversion. And it boils down to this. Uh, single line torque generally takes a very long time. Fast loop is adequate and usually much faster. And displacing the volume of the conditioning devices takes three times as much uh, in terms of calculated volume. So this is basically what we've proven uh, up, to, up to this point 
in the lecture. Okay, here's the overall kind of fancy dancy picture. It tells you all kinds of wonderful uh, information here. So we have a process, we have our fast loop, we have a high pressure side over here, we have a low pressure side over here. Uh, nothing in here really telling us that uh, we're gonna get a pressure drop, but we, I guess, have to assume that. Then we have our analyzer takeoff point, some tubing that takes us to the sample conditioning unit, which again, contains all of our uh, conditioning elements, pressure, flow, temperature, filters, uh, check valves, calibration facility, all that kind of good stuff. Feeds that to the analyzer. The analyzer does uh, its work and then gets rid of the waste uh, some way, somehow. Okay, uh, here we got sample hardware. So we've spoke about most of these individual pieces here a little bit already, but we'll get into them uh, a little bit in more in depth here. Um, all of this equipment is divided basically into four subsystems. Uh, the subsystems are extraction, which includes probes and valves that are associated with getting the process out of the, or the medium out of the process. Then we have the transport subsystem, which includes tubing pumps, meters, valves, and vaporizers that are used in the transporting of that sample. Then we get to the conditioning unit, this unit that we see here in the diagram, which contains all of our goodies, our, our rotometers, uh, our coolers, our filters, dryers, uh, heaters, cages, scrubbers, all this different type of hardware. And you can see in a system like this, now um, there's a lot of contributions to the volume of the system, right? We're running quarter inch tubing uh, up to the point we get into this cabinet, maybe 100 feet long. And then just within this cabinet, we've probably got, you know, 20 feet of tubing. And then the volume of all of these uh, chambers. And something that we'll mention, uh, mention later is particularly when you see something like this uh, gauge here uh, that has a T, we get flow that comes across here all the time, flows through uh, and goes through. But these little areas above the flow line and before the actual gauge, these are kind of nefarious little areas that allow stagnant uh, gases and things to build up. And that's really why we, we run that three times time. Um, so that we got, you know, enough flow going through here that we can get the swirl in there to get all the uh, funky stale stuff out of these kind of idle areas. And I think I address that again uh, in another slide. And then the fourth uh, subsystem uh, in sample hardware is the safety hardware. Uh, this includes block valves, relief valves, and check valves. Uh, I don't know if we can see any of the giddies in here or not, but there's some valves in here. There's a uh, check valve there. Uh, I don't see a relief valve anywhere, but there's probably one in there somewhere. So four different components or subsystems uh, in the sample hardware. Okay, when we are designing the sample system, we have to consider a bunch of things. First and foremost, uh, the sample uh, process, uh, pulling the sample must be safe and reliable first and foremost. Second, uh, most important thing is that it must be representative. Again, meaning that by the time it gets to the analyzer, it should resemble pretty closely what it was when we pulled it out of the process. Uh, third consideration is we must have an acceptable uh, lag time. Again, 90 seconds was kind of the number that we're using in the ILM. Fourth thing we have to consider, uh, meeting the analyzer specs for temperature, pressure, uh, etc. So this is where we have to consider all the components that we put in the uh, conditioning section of the analyzer system. And finally, we have to deal with cost and depends who you talk to. Uh, this may be higher or lower in the list, but for our purposes, uh, this is the way we're dealing with it here. So this is all the things that we have to consider uh, when we're designing a, a sample system. And throughout the courses of your uh, careers and your field experience, uh, this might just come to you as, as second nature because it's often repetitive. Um, but again, somebody has done all this thinking, uh, usually beforehand, before we get to it, we kind of just install, uh, maintain that kind of thing. But um, someone has done all of this calculating, all of this thinking uh, at some point in time. So it's good to know uh, what the variables are that have been considered. Now, we also have to know some details about the sample itself, and you'll find sometimes, depending on your organization, you may have 
uh, something like this sample point information sheet, uh, which will give you some valuable information that deals specifically with the sample uh, that we can use in, in conjunction um, with the analyzer requirements to make sure that we pick all the proper uh, hardware required to uh, get a representative sample uh, from the process to the analyzer in a safe and representative fashion. Okay, uh, again here, analyzer system components, we got more of them, we got the, the transport system here, we got the conditioning system here, uh, we got the analyzer itself, we got the different environmental issues that we've addressed in terms of analyzer houses and ha hazardous locations, environmental considerations, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then of course the sample recovery system where we deal with the waste um, in a number of different ways, whether it's put back to the process, uh, flared off or uh, sent into some type of a recycling um, treatment sort of a, a scenario. Okay, so functional overview of what we've addressed so far. Uh, sample system starts at the process connection where a tap in the line allows us to extract a sample of the process uh, in some fashion, maybe directly pumped, maybe fast loop, maybe distant, yada, yada, yada. Uh, there may be a specialized probe that is inserted to the stream to draw from the center of the pipe where the process is well mixed. Again, we say aim for the center third of the pipe and also pay attention to uh, the, the phase of our sample. Uh, again, gases are drawn off the top of the pipe, liquids are drawn off the side of the pipe. Uh, unless you're 100% certain that your liquid sample is super clean, in which case you may have seen it drawn off the bottom of the pipe, um, but as a general rule, we take it off the side. The sample is then transported through tubing uh, to the sample handling equipment to be conditioned so it is suitable for an analyzer to use. And that involves, of course, all kinds of different hardware. After the analyzer is done, it is then moved to the waste recovery section for disposal. So this is really uh, what we've addressed in the last uh, 100 pages or so of of the island. So uh, lots of little dirty uh, devilish details in here, but this is basically what we've proven up till now. <clears throat> Some more on design considerations here on page 20 uh, includes things like design, uh, determining the best probe for the job and the best positioning for a representative sample. So again, understanding your process uh, is important in order to be able to select the proper probe. Um, making the transport as fast as possible. Again, trying to make sure that we're within a real amount of time. Um, deciding where to return the sample. So are we just gonna dump it into the garbage can or flare it or whatever it happens to be. Uh, the conditioning system, of course, meeting the needs of the analyzer, how to handle the waste. And then of course, considering, uh, considering the associated hazards. And we haven't really talked about associated hazards very much, um, but again, uh, these analyzers are uh, application specific and some applications uh, can be high pressure, can be high temperature, can be toxic, can be, uh, you know, a, a number of different things. But we have to be aware of all the different variables that are involved right from the process tapping point all the way to uh, the handling of the waste at the end. Okay, block valves. Uh, and again, here we get into some relatively basic stuff here, uh, describing some of the components with a little bit more detail. Uh, block valves, of course, uh, make maintenance easier. And we haven't seen these in a lot of our diagrams, but they should all have them. Uh, something like this, so that we can isolate, so that we can do our troubleshooting and our maintenance. Uh, very important. Okay, uh, maintenance considerations. Specifically here it says now, regular maintenance items at ground level for easy access, which is kind of a no brainer. Um, but again, not always possible. Um, again, taking into consideration transport time. Uh, if you're analyzing something that's way up in a stack, for example, it might have to come hundreds, uh, hundreds of feet. So you have to, of course, be considering how long it takes to get that sample uh, from A to B. Um, we also have to be able to uh, protect ourselves when we're doing the work uh, from the process or any, any hazards that are inherent to that process. Again, toxics, corrosives, flammables, hot, cold, high pressure, all of these things uh, we have to uh, protect ourselves from, right? If our probe, for example, is uh, in a high pressure process, uh, 
and we've got one of those packing gland arrangements where we can undo the packing gland and we can bring out our probe. Well, you're going to want to make sure that you've got some kind of a tag lead on there so that you can't blow the probe right out of the process and into your face. So there's lots of um, things that we have to consider just to make sure that it's uh, manageable and safe from a maintenance point of view. Okay, limitations uh, of sample systems here. The two, two most serious concerns when designing a system uh, is again that the sample lag time is as short as possible and that the sample remains representative. Um, of course, besides safety. Um, but these are the two main things that we're concerned when we're, we're designing a sample system. Um, of course, besides safety, which is always number one. <clears throat> Um, some other things that we haven't spoke about yet here uh, is compatibility. Some processes will react with the materials in the transport system, and we need to know that. Uh, we don't want reactions within the system uh, to change the sample, and we, of course, don't want reactions uh, within the system to corrode our piping and cause uh, unplanned escapes, which is, um, is undesirable, I guess, to say the least. Most common materials uh, used for most sample systems are stainless steel. Uh, in our applications, usually it's stainless steel, but special applications re require special materials. So you may see glass and plastics. Uh, Teflon is one of the big ones. You'll see Teflon membranes uh, on a ton of the sensors that we, uh, that we deal with, and you'll see that mentioned uh, in future lectures. Glass and plastics, stainless steel, uh, they are less reactive and selected specifically for the process. And I believe the IOM has a table uh, in it that tells you different types of processes and the different types of materials that are compatible uh, with this type of processes. And we don't need to be uh, ninja gurus for this. Um, like I say, there is a table. So all you have to do is understand your process and then apply uh, one of these uh, sorts of tables so you're, you know you're picking a, a compatible transport uh, material. Dead space, as I mentioned earlier, and I wasn't sure if I had another tile on it or not, um, but here it is. So dead space, again, is found where there's not always flow in the system, uh, usually in legs or branches of the transport system. And again, if these spaces fill up, we end up getting stale material uh, contaminating our sample. And again, this is kind of why we run that uh, three times uh, thing here. The idea is that it gets in there and it purges out all the uh, stale stuff that's been lingering in these dead spaces. Okay, representative samples. Once again, if you haven't caught on yet, representative samples are relatively important. Um, gas analyzers are designed to measure gas, obviously, liquid analyzers to measure liquid. Uh, sometimes, however, we'll get a sample that's a mix of both, uh, and we have to adjust and design our sample system accordingly um, so that the conditioning portion uh, has the equipment in it to maintain the phase required by the analyzer. Uh, we don't want things like a liquid flashing off into a gas at the analyzer or a, a gas condensing into a liquid at the analyzer because, uh, again, these analyzer, uh, analyzers are very expensive uh, and we create maintenance issues, of course, if we're not presenting the proper uh, phase that the analyzer is expecting. Objective three, so common troubleshooting techniques, and this is uh, pretty sweet and uh, short. Troubleshooting an analyzer system uh, can be tricky due to all the components are involved, right? We have, uh, we have probes, uh, we have the process itself, we have the tubing that gets you from here to here, and then we have that conditioning uh, system that has all that different hardware in it. And then, of course, we have the analyzer itself that comes with uh, many different types of technologies um, that we have to understand in order to be able to uh, isolate the areas that we want to check. Um, but basically, the ILM outlines, uh, outlines five, uh, five steps that are uh, designed to help us troubleshoot a little bit easier. Okay. First and foremost is understanding the block diagram. Uh, we, we're going to pound this into you uh, in third year and in fourth year. The block diagrams are a great way to, to sit down at your desk and have a look at the big picture uh, right in front of you so you can kind of narrow it down to where you think uh, you should start looking. From that, you can establish uh, an area of uncertainty. Then you narrow that area down by making certain checks, you know, going out to the field and, and 
checking certain areas. Uh, understanding the drawings and how each component operates. Uh, obviously, to troubleshoot uh, different components, you have to have a, uh, a good understanding of how, of how they operate. Uh, you have to know uh, what a filter is in order to be able to check a filter for plugage. You have to know uh, filter specifications in order to know if you've got the right size micron filter in there uh, to suit your process. So understanding uh, the individual little bits uh, comes into play. And then finally, the last thing that we do is isolating the cause to a faulty component. And we learned earlier uh, that 80% of our uh, sample or analyzer issues are in the sample uh, conditioning or sample transport system. So uh, that's generally where we're going to look. So here's the block diagram. Uh, we have our sample point here at the process. Uh, we have the probe, we have the transfer line, we have the conditioning system, and finally gets to the analyzer. And the analyzer has the, the recovery uh, system, which is either going to take it back to the process as shown here, or dump it off to, to flare or a waste handling system. So we can look at it and go, well, where where is the most likely where is the most likely place that we're going to have an error? Well, it's probably not likely in this area here. It's probably not likely uh, in this area here. It's generally in the in the area between where we take the sample off and the sample conditioning system. We have so much stuff in here, uh, you know, tiny little orifices, um, the rotometers that have the little balls in there that tend to get stuck, filters that get plugged, all that kind of stuff. So by having this all in here, you know, it kind of gives you an easy way to, to select where you're going to start. So here's a good way to start. I looked at the block diagram. I'm thinking, well, the analyzer's got power on it and there's numbers on it, so I'm not going to start there. So let's go to the let's go to the next uh, next possible thing. I'm standing at the analyzer. Let's crack a let's crack a nut on the tubing and see if we get flow. And if uh, we have flow here, well, then we can assume that it's something beyond. If we don't have flow here, well, then we're gonna we're gonna go back to the other side. We're gonna crack a nut here, and we're gonna see if we got flow here. If I don't have flow here, well, then it's probably something in this area. If I do have flow here, but I don't have flow here. Well, that tells us that it's probably going to be in the sample conditioning system. So again, using the block diagram effectively uh, will help you uh, zone in on your area of uncertainty. Using a method called half-split troubleshooting. Um, this is a concept that allows us to minimize the amount of checks to be done. So basically, the theory here is that you start at the halfway point versus the tap point and then half way again so they right, we're, we're not getting we're not getting a good reading to the analyzer so does it make sense for me to go all the way to the sample tap white crack it here oh yeah i've got flow 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 or does it make more sense to go halfway and go okay do i have flow here yes or no do i have flow here yes or no usually if you can identify if I'm, you're going to walk this way or you're going to walk this way, right? So the idea is to make it as uh, efficient as possible for you. So they call that half-split troubleshooting. Okay, design problems. What happens What happens if we don't consider all of these things that we've just been talking about, the, the transport system and the conditioning system and the pressures and the temperatures and the phases? Well, we can get all kinds of wonderful issues, but the ones that bother us the most, of course, besides safety, uh, are how, not having a representative sample and having long lag times, right? This is a control issue depending on your uh, control load mode, whether it's direct or indirect or optimizing. Uh, and not having a representative sample is, is just bad in general. Um, Non-representative samples can be caused by a number of different things, uh, such as a bad sample point, so not getting uh, not getting a representative sample, just basically uh, based on where you're taking your sample from. Maybe it's too close to something or too far from something and the sample is settled out. Um, poor extraction, maybe we've got the wrong type of probe uh, going, going on in there. Uh, maybe our, our transport time is too long. Uh, maybe we come from a hot building uh, and then we bring our sample out of the hot building. Uh, and it goes through uh, the atmosphere, which is minus 20 today. And the gas that we pulled out suddenly condenses uh, and turns into a liquid. So that causes problems. We have to be aware of these things that can happen. 
Uh, long lag times, of course, uh, can be caused by low uh, flow rates or high volume lines. So we learned that we can either increase the flow rate or we can reduce our volume in order to speed up uh, our transport time. So these are all the things that we've kind of discussed. These are all the issues that uh, we hopefully have uh, provided you with the tools to uh, be able to overcome should you see any of these problems in the field. Uh, some specific uh, things here on oxygen uh, sample point choice here. So uh, again, we said oxygen uh, monitoring is usually kind of optimization sort of uh, uh, application, but uh, the ILM here uh, specifies uh, looking at this uh, individually here. So different mounting locations. So stack in situ. We got up here, so an in-situ oxygen analyzer, uh, transmitter on one side, receiver on the other side. So stack analysis, uh, usually path style uh, and, and CO when we're up here. Uh, oxygen analyzer is not usually path style, but CO usually is. Um, but in-situ in the stack, uh, what's the problem with this here? Well, it's too far from the burner and there's a really long, uh, really long lag time. Other things that could happen is that you are likely to get air leakage uh, into the flue gas ducting in stack. So between between the burner here and the measurement here, we could be remember this is kind of on a on a on a vacuum, right? It has the potential as as this gas flow is coming up and going through this system, it could draw ambient air into any holes anywhere in this system. And you've seen in lots of burners furnaces, things like that. There's inspection doors and all kinds of things. Um, so we want to uh, we want to be aware that there is potential for leakage in at any point after the combustion, which could cause false readings by the time uh, we measure it way up here. Uh, at line in the duct application, looking at this one here, uh, leg time may be okay if, if it's mounted close enough uh, to the kiln is what they're seeing here, but we still have that possible air leakage uh, into the duct here again, um, just by nature of its physical construction. Last but not least here, we have distant or extractive sample conditioning. Uh, generally, this is a long lag time uh, type installation here, and we can have problems if it's too long. Uh, and that also, of course, involves longer runs, which increases our volume. So that's something that we also have to uh, worry about as well. And then as again, you see here in the, in the bottom here, air leakage. So air leakage, air leakage, air leakage, all of these things are things that you have to consider, especially when we're talking about measuring uh, oxygen, because we want it to be true and representative. Uh, we don't want any additional oxygen in there that we're not looking for. Okay, device specific problems. Uh, again, this kind of uh, involves making sure that you have the, uh, the sample uh, appropriate in phase and condition for for the analyzer. So uh, sample liquids from the side, gases from the top, things like that. Uh, be aware of phase changes. Um, reducing pressure reduces a dew point, things like that. So you can get condensation. We don't want that. Uh, reductions in pressure uh, may cause a liquid to vaporize. Again, if you've got a liquid analyzer uh, and, you, and you reduce the pressure, um, just like an aerosol can, it's high pressure inside the can, you press the valve, it's low pressure outside the can, it turns into a gas. Of course, that could be a problem uh, if the liquid analyzer is looking for a liquid. Okay, maintenance issues. Uh, common issues, plug filters, leaky valves, and sticky rotometers. These are really the, probably, the, probably the top three. Um, we can get around that by having redundant equipment. Uh, that's beneficial, so here we have our transport line. Uh, coming to what we see here is a new piece of equipment called a preconditioner box. Uh, so if you know your system's uh, prone to, you know, gumming up and mucking up and plugging up, that kind of stuff, installing redundant uh, conditioning hardware is, is probably worthwhile uh, for you. So you can do that. Okay, grab sampling. This is the uh, last objective here. Those of you who are kind of uh, instrument instrument uh, technicians slash field operators. This will uh, provide some good information for you. Uh, those of you who are not involved in grab sampling at all, uh, this is probably not gonna be very useful at all. And I would say as a general rule, uh, we've 
the, the majority of this ILM deals with continuous, uh, continuous analyzers. Um, and from this point forward, that's really what we're going to be talking about in fourth year. Um, but just be aware that there is still applications uh, where samples are, are pulled manually from the field and then transported to a lab for analysis. So to do that, that involves grab sampling, and we're going to look at, uh, in my opinion, a little bit too much about grab sampling, um, but I'll leave most of it, uh, most of the reading up to you. We'll just kind of hit on the high points here. Okay, so grab sampling, again, is removing a sample to a sample cylinder and then transporting it to an analyzer, typically in a laboratory. Um, these sample cylinders are also called sample bombs. And as you can see here, there's many different um, styles of them. Okay, considerations for grab sampling. I'll get them all up here at once here, hopefully. And you'll see there's many of them. Uh, and these are all things that can occur from the time the sample is taken to the time that it's analyzed. And remember, you're at the mercy uh, of the person who's grabbing the sample, right? So temperature of the sample could change. The pressure of the sample could change. Uh, temperature and pressure are related. So if the temperature cools down, the pressure is going to go down. The temperature goes up, the pressure is going to go up whatever. Possible contamination of the sample, so whether the cylinder was clean when you started or whether Cletus, the operator, um, did the proper procedure to get, to get a sample, that could be a problem. Uh, the location of the sample extraction, again, uh, could come into play. The stability of the original fluid, the effects of the sample bomb uh, that it might have on the sample. So again, this is reactivity between the uh, sample that we're pulling and the and bomb itself, you know, is it stainless, is it glass, is it Teflon, whatever it happens to be. Uh, phase changes, uh, we want to be, you know, again, aware of phase changes. It could, it could condense between A and B. Uh, samples must be homogenous. Again, that just means well mixed. Um, and when we take liquid samples, we only fill the sample bomb up to 80% to allow for, uh, for expansion. Just this is the same same logic, same theory behind why you go and get your propane tank filled for your trailer and they only fill it to 80%. Well, because they're filling it with liquid uh, liquid propane and as it gets warmer, uh, it expands. Uh, so we have to have room for that expansion. So 80% is the number, just like our propane tanks. And long story short, grab sample must be representative. Uh, and the main reason we don't usually use grab samples anymore is because too many of these variables uh, can affect the representative, uh, representativity uh, of our sample. Okay, the bombs, uh, page 36, must be inert, meaning non-reactive with our sample. Uh, to achieve this, they may be glass, plastic, or stainless steel. They must have a vapor space allowance of 20%. Uh, they could be single-ended or double-ended, and that has to do with how you fill them. Um, I don't I'm not 100 percent sure if I have added uh, specifics for the different types of bombs uh, in this lecture or not. But some of these bombs uh, have like one valve uh, where you uh, you just hook it up to the process, you open the valve and you you know, fill the fill the bottle and then you close the valve and you disconnect it and you take it away. Now uh, you're hoping that there's nothing else in your in your bomb uh, to contaminate your process uh, or to loop to loot your process that you've sampled. Um, another way to do it is have the double-ended, uh, the double-ended bomb has a valve on each end, so you connect it to the process, open the tail end of the valve, open the front end of the valve, and you allow the, you allow the process to purge right through the bomb uh, for a little while, and then you close the back end valve, fill it up, and then close the front end valve and, and take it off. So uh, that's probably more talking than I need to do, but again, different types of bombs uh, have different types of procedures. A uh, specific mention here of a piston type uh, sample bomb, uh, which allows sampling at pipeline pressures. Uh, this leads me to believe that I probably haven't spoke individually about this particular one. Um, but I have had students uh, come through the classroom who have worked on pipelines that have used these piston uh, type sampling uh, bombs in the field. And pipelines are one of a few unique applications where it might not be feasible to have a continuous online analyzer all the time due to uh, the remote nature of pipelines and the fact that you might not have power uh, out there so the operators would have to go and do ground samples. 
Okay, gas sampling, page 38. Uh, and this is again pertaining to uh, grab samples. Uh, common problems are incorrectly taken samples that are contaminated with air. So this has to do with the purging uh, and, and procedures that you use to fill the bomb. Uh, dirty bombs, of course, causing contamination could be a factor. Uh, and composition changes due to temperature and pressure changes. Uh, and again, temperature and pressure uh, has major effects on gas, not so much effect on liquids. Okay, uh, different methods for gas sampling here. So the first one is called uh, fill and empty method. Uh, basically, you, you vent it through the bomb until it's full. And I've really summarized these down quite a bit. Second method is the evacuated container method uh, in which the cylinder that we're filling is actually under a vacuum already. So you, it's under a pre-vacuum. Uh, you connect it up to the process, open the process valve, open the bomb valve, and it actually by nature sucks the sample in rather than it being forced in by the process. And the third gas sampling method here is again that piston type uh, that we talked about for natural gas. Uh, specific, specifically uh, pipeline kind of application uh, dealing with natural gas uh, here in Alberta. Okay, automated sampling we'll hit on really quickly here. Um, when I worked at the wastewater treatment plant um, here in Red Deer a number of years ago here, they had several uh, areas where they did this automated sampling. And automated sampling provides a composite sample, which means it takes, uh, takes a grab every hour or some predetermined amount of time throughout the day fills a container at the end of the day the container gets taken to a lab and the lab will an an uh, analyze it um, and by doing these little pinch samples throughout the day it gives a more reliable sample than just a single grab sample um, this can be done manually by a guy who comes you know comes by every little while cracks a valve and you know adds 100 milliliters uh, to the container but typically uh, they're they're using a device called a sample extractor, which is a uh, automated uh, sample extracting device that is either driven electronically or by air or by a combination, uh, which basically just plunges in, plunges out, pulls out a specific volume uh, at a set interval. Okay, stack gas particulate sampling, and we'll talk about this. Uh, and this is kind of important because we do talk a little bit about combustion. Uh, we'll actually talk about combustion quite a bit uh, when we get to uh, combustion analyzers. So this will carry over. Uh, stack gas and particulate sampling. Most uh, particularly ones that burn solid fuels, are going to have particulates in them. Uh, when we have particulates, the government wants to know about that. So we have to measure that, uh, and we measure that with an opacity monitor. Uh, and what an opacity monitor does is it measures the amount uh, of lights that the particles that are in the stack gas block of a stream of light that's transmitted across the stack. So it is a path style analyzer um, that measures the amount of light that makes it across uh, or that isn't blocked by particles uh, in the stream. Okay, so uh, this again, excuse me, specific to stack gas and sampling. Again, probably a little bit deeper than we need to know as, as techs. Um, but again, uh, worth mentioning here, manual sampling is done to verify the performance of a opacity transmitter, okay? So ideally samples are taken eight stack diameters downstream of any disturbance. So the, the, the stack is running, uh, you know, comes out of a kiln, is running horizontal and then bends up into a stack. We wanna give, you know, it's a two foot stack. We want to be 16 feet up from that elbow, for example, before we start uh, doing our measurements, uh, and two diameters upstream of the exit point. So not cl too close to the top, not too close to the elbow at the bottom. Uh, that allows us to get proper mixing throughout the uh, cross-sectional area of the pipe, which is what we're looking at here, basically down the stack. If you want to look at this picture that way, you're looking at down the stack. And if you're going to go and verify your opacity analyzer, you're going to go up there uh, with a handheld analyzer and you're going to stick your probe, basic kinetic probe, into the flow stream pointing down at these sample points here in order to get a representation of what's going on across the whole cross-sectional area of the stack. So again, probably a little bit deeper than we need to know, but, uh, you know, knowledge is power. 
Okay, sampling for stack acids must be isokinetic. And again, the key point behind isokinetic is flowing velocity. Uh, flowing velocity allows us to maintain suspension of the suspended particles. And that is necessary in order to get a representative sample. So in order to do this, we have to make sure that we don't over or under sample. So here we have a perfect situation, scenario A, isokinetic, meaning that the flow rates are equal, the particles are distributed equally throughout the cross-sectional area, and we get a nice representative sample. Here, we have a neck down type situation here where the concentration uh, increases because we've uh, effectively increased, uh, decreased the volume. Uh, same amount of particles in a smaller space means that we're increasing the concentration or oversampling. And then going the other way, not as common, but I guess it could happen. Going the other way, uh, we are undersampling, meaning we have a greater concentration here than we actually have over here because uh, our stack size is decreased. So these are specific, again, to uh, stack sampling. And this has nothing to do with this ILM whatsoever, but I. It was in this PowerPoint, and I just left it in here as a review from the previous uh, sample system um, lecture. An analyzer is online when all of the following considerations are met. Connected, drawing sample, measuring one or more component, and sending data. If any one of these is not true, we are not online. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. Any questions?